All right, Shalom. I want to give all praises to Yahweh by Hashem Yahweh Shai. And um, double honors to the apostles of the Great Millstone and honors to you brothers doing this work in truth and sincerity. So this is a uh, part two for um, biblical comparison of Hebrew Israelites and Israeli Jews. So this is uh, Revelation chapter two, verse nine. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. So, Yahushua is pretty much saying here that he knows our works and our tribulation and our poverty, which is you so-called Negroes, Latinos, and Native Americans, spread throughout North, Central, and South America and throughout the four corners of the earth, that pretty much that they're in tribulation and that they're in poverty. And the blasphemy, which is the filthy lie of these uh, Israeli Jews that say they are Jews, but are not, but are the synagogue, which means the chief house of uh, Satan. Because pretty much uh, the spiritual demon Satan is working with them for uh, their plans for a new world order. So they can try to get the birthright back between Jacob and Esau which the birthright was natu naturally belonged to Jacob, which was our, one, our forefather, whose name was changed to Israel. Right. So this is a document off of Wikipedia about the Rothschilds. And um, as you can see, you know, they claim Jewish descent, you know, as far as from the last lesson that I um, just previously made, um, you know, that pretty much these uh, fake Jews want, want to claim our heritage as far as, you know, why they're in the land of Israel and pretty much that land is pretty much doesn't belong to them. says, the Rothschild's family is a family descended from Meyer Amschel Rothschild, a court Jew to the German land groves of Hesse Kassel in the free city of Frankfurt, who established his banking business in the 1760s. Unlike most previous court Jews, uh, Rothschild managed to bequeath his wealth and establish an international banking family through his five sons. Five lines of the Austrian branch of the family have been elevated to Austrian nobility, being given five hereditary titles of barons of the Habsburg Empire by Emperor Francis II in 1816. Another line of the British branch of the family was elevated to Queen Victoria, who granted the family two hereditary titles of Baron 1847 and Baron 1885. During the 19th century, when it was at its height, the Rothschilds family is believed to believed by some to have possessed the largest private fortune in the world, which they still do, as well as the largest private fortune in modern world history. The family's wealth is believed to have subsequently declined as it was divided amongst hundreds of descendants. Today, Rothschild businesses are far less well known than they were throughout the 19th century, although they encompass a diverse range of fields, including finance, real estate, mining, energy, mixed farming, wine, and charities. Yeah, because pretty much, you know, that goes back to the prophecy that, you know, these about these devils basically being in rulership for the time, so pretty much they get to enjoy the fatness of the earth, that, that was part of the, the uh, promise that um, Isaac had gave as far as the blessing to uh, Esau for in a lot of times. And as you can see, through the Rothschilds, you know, these devils are in power. You know, basically they're trying to claim 
our nationality, which has been Jews and Israelites and trying to claim our nationality and as far as being in that land. So, this is uh, Numbers chapter 24, verse 20. And when he looked on Amalek, Amalek being, you know, one of the sons of uh, Esau, you can find that in the book of Genesis, he took up his parable and said, Amalek was the first of the nations, but his latter end shall be that he perished forever. All right. Because pretty much once uh, the kingdom of heaven is established, you know, the real Israelites, which is you so-called Negroes, Latinos, and Native Americans, you know, your kingdom is going to be established. And after a thousand years, once we have these Edomites in subjection, you know, we're pretty much going to exterminate them off the face of the earth. And part of the crimes that they have to pay for is claiming that, claiming that they were of... Um, the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But through this through this lesson, you know, I hope to, you know, through the spirit and power of Yahweh Hashem Yahweh Shah, demonstrate that they were not at all part of they're not at all part of that line, nor do they have any business claiming such descent. So Is a, a article called "The Six Million Really Died" by Richard E. Harwood, and I'm just gonna go through a few points on pretty much that whole BS agenda that they had behind claiming that six million uh, Ashkenazi Jews really died during the course of uh, World War II. Atrocity propaganda concerning the German occupation, and in particular their treatment of the Jews, has done nothing but increase its violence and elaborate and elaborate its catalog of horrors. Gruesome paperback books with lurid covers continue to roll from the presses, adding continuously to a growing mythology of the concentration camps, especially to the story that no less than six million Jews were exterminated in them. The ensuing pages will reveal this claim to be the most colossal piece of fiction and the most successful of deceptions. But here an attempt may be made to answer an important question. What, what, what has rendered the atrocity stories of the Second World War so uniquely different from those of the first? Why were the latter retracted while the former are reiterated louder than ever? Is it possible that the story of the six million Jews is serving a political purpose, which it is, even that it is a form of political blackmail, so far as the Jewish people themselves are concerned, the deception has been an incalculable benefit. Every conceivable race and nationality had its share in suffering in the Second World War, but none has so successfully elaborated it and turned it into such a great advantage. The alleged extent of their persecution quickly aroused sympathy for the Jewish national homeland they had sought for so long. After the war, the British government did little to prevent Jewish immigration to Palestine, which they had declared illegal. And it was not long afterwards that the Zionists wrested from the government in the land of Palestine and created their haven from persecution, the state of Israel. So really that just kind of, uh, that basically just outlines what, you know, Hit the Hitler Nazi regime was really about and that it was really not to exterminate um, the Jews, the, the Khazar Jew, Khazarian Jews off the face of the earth, but basically it was to immigrate them in the land of Israel, you know, so they can further claim our nationality. Alright, this is a German policy towards the Jews prior to the war. Rightly or wrongly, the Germany of Adolf Hitler considered the Jews to be a disloyal and avaricious element within the national community, 
as well as a force of decadence in Germany's cultural life. This was held to be particularly unhealthy since during the Weimar period, the Jews had risen to a position of remarkable strength and influence in the nation, particularly in law, finance, and the mass media, even though they constituted only 5% of the population. You know, showing you that, you know, the, the elites was pretty much behind that and, you know, they have their hand in pretty much everything that you see, like the media, finance, you know, global trade, as you can see to this day, you know. By 1939, the great majority of German Jews had immigrated, all of them with a sizable proportion of their assets. Never at any time had the Nazi leadership even contemplated a policy of genocide towards them. So there you have it, you know, it was it was never a policy implemented or that they found on record or that they can, you know, basically truthfully claim that, you know, it was a plan to exterminate all these uh, Khazarian Jews off the face of the earth, you know. It says, Zionist policy study. Now, I'm going to just go to the highlighted point. It had been a main plank of the National Socialist Party platform before 1933 and was published by the party and pamphlet forum. This stated that the revival of Israel as a Jewish state, which must let less acceptable since it will result in, a, in perpetual war and disruption in the Arab world, which has indeed been the case. You know, that pretty much shows you that, you know, the Lord don't favor these uh these uh Khazars being over in the land of Israel right now because that's pretty much what it been since they established themselves in um Israel in nineteen forty eight that pretty much the Arabs that's been over in that land occupying it been making war with them. So that shows that uh, that's one way to know that pretty much the Lord ain't really with them as far as them being over in that land. And that goes also back to bib biblical prophecy as well. This is uh, Isaiah 2 and 1. The word that I Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow in unto it. Right, because the chief mountain representing the government is talk, talking about the nation of Israel. Basically, we're going to be established on top of all rulerships and dominions, dominions on the earth through the spirit and power of Yahweh Bosh and Yahweh Shah. When Yahweh Shah sets claim to rulership once he comes, comes back to set everything in order. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the Most High of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now, is that happening right now? I mean, as far as, you know, pretty much you can see the all there is is war and turmoil going on over in the land of Israel is because pretty much the Rothschilds is uh, funding it, you know, for um, their New World Order. So there's really, really no um, nations coming to learn the ways of the Most High from them because, you know, they don't they don't really follow um, the ways of the Most High. Like, for example, you got Pink City, where, you know, they got fags and lesbians walking around. And, they, and they're supposed to be the the people of the Lord? No, that that's completely off. All right, verse four. It says, "And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more." So, by them being over in that land right now, that's that's one example of know that that prophecy is not fulfilled and they don't fulfill that prophecy 
as far as coming into the land of Israel. Alright, so with that, let's get the next scripture. This is uh, Micah chapter 2, verse 1. Woe, meaning destruction, to them that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds. When the morning is light, they practice it because it is in the power of their hand. And they covet fields and take them by violence and houses and take them away. So they oppress a man in his house, even a man in his heritage. Right, because pretty much, you know, the elites, it's given into their, their hand to pretty much, uh, you know, have rulership and dominion over the earth. And pretty much one of the ways that they oppressed us was that since, you know, we were dispersed throughout the four corners of the earth, and part of them having to do with uh, basically us being in captivity as, you know, you know, they, once you, you may do a little bit of research, you'll find that they had heavy involvement in, in the slave trade and also um, them being over in our land claiming, claiming our descent, that's, that's oppressing us in our heritage. So, there's a, one article I wanted to go over, it's called, uh, was Hitler a Rothschild by David Icke and pretty much you can go through this article and pretty much it'll detail a lot of uh, a lot of uh, the Rothschild's agenda and what um, what you know World War two was really was really about Pretty much, I mean, once you read this article, you know, you can read this article for yourself. And you'll pretty much find that uh, Hitler himself was an illegitimate of one of the Rothschild's family, making him one a Khazarian Jew by, by descent. So, uh, I'll read this point right here. Baron Rothschild replied, I created the Yeshuv, I alone. Therefore, no man, neither colonists nor organizations, have the right to interfere in my plans. What was that plan? Basically, establishing a Jewish community in the land of Israel. In one sentence, you have the true attitude of the Rothschilds to Jewish people and indeed the human population in general. These are not the Jews. You know. uh, here's, here's a little BS that he kind of goes into. You know. There are not non human bloodline of a reptilian genetic code who hide behind the Jewish people and use them as a screen and a means of an end, according to Simon Scammer's book two Rothschilds in the land of Israel. The Rothschilds acquired 80% of the land of Israel. Edmund de Rothschild worked closely with Theodore Harzi, who happened to be the founder of Zionism, the political movement created to ensure a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Rothschild was the power behind Kaim Weizem, another leader of Zionism. As Rothschild told Weizmann, Without me, Zionism would not have succeeded, but without Zionism, my work wouldn't have been stuck to death. So now, with the Rothschilds increasing their financing of Jewish settlements in Palestine, and with their agents and governments officially supporting their plans for a Rothschild, for a Rothschild, sorry Jewish homeland, they needed a catalyst which would demolish Arab protests at the takeover of their country. You know, that which, you know, goes back to the whole point of, you know, this article. You know, and about pretty much making up that whole figure about six million Jews, which they changed from different variations. You know, sometimes it went from six million to nine million or 
you know, they basically they couldn't get their number right, you know, to suit their um, pr their propaganda. Alright, so this is uh, Proverbs chapter 29, verse 2. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice, which in the kingdom of heaven, you know, even though these nations are going to be getting their asses kicked, kicked because we're going to rule them with a the rod of iron, you know, basically the people is, is going to be rejoiced because, you know, everything is going to be put back in order. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn it. So this is uh, Job chapter 9, verse 24. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covered the faces of the judges thereof. If not, where and who is he? You know, basically they claim themselves to be the children of Israel. I mean, you know, you got pictures of uh, Cesare Bolger depicted as um, who the world knows as Jesus Christ. You know, and uh, they basically claim in our descent, you know. And because the real judges are you so-called Latinos and Native Americans, but you know that just points out you know that pretty much they don't f at all fit that as far as being you know part of uh, the nation of Israel as far as the the Bible is concerned and as far as where the children of Israel will be at in the latter times. So that I'm gonna close out with part two. Shalom.